We are in a revolution. But it is a revolution in which the side that fires the first shot loses. We will not fire any shots because our weapon is uncommon good sense. Hello and welcome to Tractor Time. Tractor Time is brought to you by Acres USA, the voice of eco-agriculture. This episode is also brought to you by Live Earth Products. For over 30 years, humic and fulvic acid is all they do. Trust a leader in the industry. Call Live Earth Products at 435-286-2222 for a free consultation on improving your soil health. I'm your host, Ben Trollinger, editor of Acres USA Magazine. And with me today for our first live streamed episode of the show, is agroecologist Nicole Masters. She has a new book out. It's called For the Love of Soil. And there's an excerpt of that book in the August edition of Acres USA Magazine. Go to acresusa.com to subscribe. Nicole has 20 years of experience working in Australia, New Zealand, and North America to create regenerative food systems. And we're thrilled to have her with us today. Nicole, welcome to Tractor Time. Thanks for having me, Ben. Yeah, thrill doesn't even sum it up. I'm so excited to be here, so thanks. Well, I was hoping we could begin with your background. I really want to know where you grew up and what your journey was into agriculture. Yeah, so as listeners might be able to tell, I'm a New Zealander. Hopefully they can tell that. Most people think of Australian, (laughs) get themselves in trouble. Um, So born and bred in New Zealand, my father was actually a pilot flying for the Royal New Zealand Air Force. So I grew up as an Air Force brat, which might seem very far from agriculture, but in New Zealand at the time, you know, the, the rural urban divide wasn't very large. You know, we, I had relatives that were farming, surrounded by agriculture. And I spent a lot of time with him in aircraft, looking down and being very concerned. Um, you know, some of my earliest memories is being concerned around what, what I saw was happening with land management. So it's, it's kind of fascinating to be looking down um, upon the earth, I guess, and, and be concerned. Well, what were you saying? Um, in New Zealand, uh, there was a lot of erosion, so huge, huge amounts of eroding farm ground and water quality issues. So um, we like to go camping. We were, um, my whole family loves to fish and just seeing, you know, like huge amounts of sediment after storm events. So poor management, I guess, with forestry. Um, and, and that was pretty early days, you know, the industrialization of agriculture particularly into dairy in New Zealand has really only been in the last 20 odd years. Um, but even, you know, 40 years ago, there were, there were noticeable scars on the landscape that, yeah, I was just quite affected by. You were f- affected on an emotional level, but at the time, did you understand the dynamics at play? I don't think I would have understood. I just had this, like one of my, you know, you look back at what your formative um, events were and, Mount St. Helens erupting was a formative event for me. So I was five years old when it erupted, so 1980. Um, And my grandmother had me subscribe to National Geographic and just being absolutely, literally, like, I don't want to say blown away because that's a bit of a pun, but, you know, like, just being really just amazed at the power of nature and how violent, I guess, that, that volcano was and then reading onwards through National Geographic, that whole recovery of that landscape was incredibly fascinating. Um, So I think for me, I've always really been interested in nature's dynamics and landforms and then the human impact upon it. Um, And had it something, I guess, like an emotional response to, to, I I guess, feeling a landscape. And you really began your agricultural journey and roughly 2000 is that right when your when your father retired and it was his sort of dream to uh, start a farm talk a little bit about that experience and how that shaped you yeah so I had been studying um, uh, I did an ecology degree and finished university and went on to manage community gardens so I'd been kind of coming from a gardening background when dad decided to leave he was flying for Cathay Pacific at the time and um, said you know let's let's buy a farm let's let's sit down look where do we think some of the best growing conditions in New Zealand if not the world were and we found a property in the Bay of Plenty quite aptly named um, just beautiful soil and we planted 700 avocado trees restored wetlands um, and put in orchards and and we're running beef cattle as well and 
both of us were green and I think we were very fortunate with the mentors that we had and that people that were willing to share their advice. And so a lot of my early learning, I think was incredibly well supported by knowledgeable people. And it's something that I'm passionate about now too, is how do we support that next generation that's, that's coming through. Were there any sort of formative experiences, um, maybe disasters or catastrophes or mistakes that stand out in your mind that uh, acted as object lessons for you? <laughs> I think often when you when you are starting out farming, I think we all have lots of those. I mean, machinery problems, um, you know, putting in irrigation systems that, uh, you know, when someone had drilled through, but drilled through too far to put in the pins. So you've got holes on the other side of the irrigation system. So we turn it on and water's just going everywhere. Um, we had woofers, which are willing workers on organic farms. Um, mm -hmm didn't shut some gates and we ended up with uh, we had gelfy bulls that ended up with heifers um, that ended up requiring old uh, either um, c-sections which was quite an interesting experience you know like to see the side of a cow be fully opened up and you bring a calf out into the world um, was certainly you know some of the early mistakes that we had um, and you know I was I started out really into commercial that um vermiculture so composting and worms and I had really good advice with that and what was interesting is I ended up managing a household worm program for like 10 years in the city and just fascinating what disasters people can create you know and and I feel like because we had such good advice we didn't have as many disasters as potentially we could have and even to look back now like the avocados, we lost very few avocado trees um, to Phytophthora or any kind of diseases because we had good advice from the start. And we really, you know, I had mentors that would always speak to how would, how would this look in nature? What would, you know, what are avocado trees? How do they grow in, out in the wild? And, you know, it's this thick mulch. I mean, they really don't live in the soil. They're living up there in the mulch with all these fine roots. And yet, a lot of avocados are, you know, they're sprayed with chemicals and it's all herbicided and, you know, not enough kind of mulch. And then people have all these health problems. So I think in a lot of ways, we, we just had, we had some pretty good starts. Well, how did you start? What was the philosophy? Was it what you would describe now as regenerative or did it eventually get there? Where yeah, did you definitely. Begin? Yeah. Yeah. I, I certainly, I mean, we went straight into organic certification and that organic certification like that whole process and it's interesting now because I work a lot with conventional broad acre farmers and they'll be describing all these chemicals and I'm trying to work through that process with them and meanwhile in the back of my head I'm going I've never sprayed a herbicide in my life and I've, I've never applied a pesticide um, and having to learn the names of all these pesticides and, and what they do and you know try and educate people I guess around some of the implications for either human health or you know ecosystem health around some of these chemicals that we're using and um yeah I've never used one <laughs> well to sort of kick off the conversation a little bit um I want to start with a very broad question but I think it might be a good place to begin and the question is why do ecosystems collapse and what can that tell us about creating successful food production systems Oh, it's such a great question. Um, and I think if we look to the root of, you know, why do ecosystems collapse, we really need to be thinking in whole systems with everything that we do, all the actions that we take, because so many of our actions are a knee-jerk response to, I don't want this, so I'm going to do the flip side of that. Or, you know, we've got this pest, so we need to kill it with this without thinking of, well, what are the unintended consequences of that? And I think ecosystem collapses are really coming because of this gap between nature and us and we think that we are separate but actually we are nature I mean we're part of the system but we're trying to put up all these barriers and walls to how does this happen in nature how would nature take care of an insect problem or um, yeah some kind of weed issue and instead we're going for more uniformity more um you know lack of diversity how do we get these monocultures instead of what does it look like in nature which are incredibly diverse systems where the the problem becomes the solution in itself um, but we don't allow systems to do that and we try and control things and I think it's maybe realizing that actually we we don't get to control nature that's that's not our role it's um how do we work with and I think 
probably the last 140 years, maybe this is our lesson is we don't control it. It's bigger than us. And we are starting to see those multiple consequences if we're talking about insect collapse or fisheries collapsing or the reef dying or um, climate change. They are all starting to slap people around the chops pretty hard. Well, in this context, talk about the legacy of the Green Revolution, maybe define what it is for those who don't know, but also just how that has, in your view, and as you describe in the book, contributed to the, the collapse or continuing collapse of ecosystems and food production systems. Mm. I mean, it's so interesting, I guess, to think about the Green Revolution because there's so much behind it as well before it came through. But the Green Revolution really arose after World War II with the proliferation of nitrogen fertilizers um, and the, the creation of synthetic type fertilizer inputs and herbicides and fungicides and, and all the rest. But the promise was we'll be able to do um, more with less, that you know, farming will get simpler um, and more profitable. And, and unfortunately, it really hasn't created what it promised, which, which was that you know, farmers would actually be more profitable because uh, they're not really, if you look at the last 140 years. And a lot of it came out of, hey, we've made all of this technology for warfare. We know how to make nitrogen for bombs. Well, actually nitrogen will grow more product. Um, so, you know, that's kind of where we ended up with was these companies that were involved in, in war then became involved in agriculture, which, you know, I think is a concerning place to come from instead of thinking about, quality we really were chasing quantity so it's like we were growing more and more and more but actually the nutrition in that was less and less and really if you look at the history of oh well you know we need to grow this much more food to feed this you know growing population um, a lot of that happened because of more water improved water management and improved breeding um, and what we see is you know with the use of nitrogen fertilizers is we then ended up with more insect problems, more disease problems, and the loss of fertility. So it becomes this downward spiral um, uh, that's a treadmill that then becomes really, really hard to, to get off. And this is the interesting thing with traveling is really seeing the story that's playing out in a lot of broadacre areas is the same story, which is we don't know what's happening with the weather. We have so much debt. There's so much stress. Um, the inputs are having to go on and you know more and more and more. Um, the system is is not working. And I think really it is to use that terrible term, but like a perfect storm of everything coming together right now, right here. And in your new book, um, For the Love of Soil, um, you say that it isn't soil health for dummies, right? No. <laughs> um, who, did, who did you write this book for? And you know what were you hoping to convey? Yeah, so people were asking me for a soil health for dummies. And I think um, it's a lot of the technical stuff does get me really excited. Like, I think it's really fascinating. And whether or not, um, you know, a, a rancher, a farmer needs to understand, oh, here's all these cascading enzyme type effects in a plant, um, that, that information might not be as important. But to understand, well, there are dynamics that then lead to an insect or a disease or a weed. And so for me, people were asking, well, how is it you can come onto a piece of land and read it? Like, what do you see? How is it that you're seeing these things? How is it that an animal, like animal health reflects what's happening in the soil or plant health um, and, and walk people through that process? So the idea was to really try and break down my internal process um, into more step-by-step -step triages. So like, this is the number one place you need to start if you're really looking at rehabilitating or regenerating soil um, and then if that's working all right what's number two and what's number three and so trying to keep it relatively um, digestible and using people's stories to do that because I think we all learn better through hearing other people's stories and what were their experiences and what's their lives like and then how do they address challenges and uh, that's a lot of feedback I've got from people is the enjoyment of hearing other people's stories. Well I thought we should in, in beginning the discussion about your book and the contents, contents therein, I, th I thought we should define what you mean by healthy soil and, mm -hmm. and why uh, the conception of healthy soil as something that produces large crop yields is not really an, a complete explanation. No, no. And I think 
for a long time, and particularly if you're thinking of the Green Revolution, you know, production was framed as, as the success, you know, like how successful you were as a producer was based on yield, as opposed to, um, you know, do you have a system that is resilient? Do you have soils that are able to hold on to and then release water slowly, able to hold on to nutrients, able to suppress diseases, um, are vibrant and alive? And yeah, that wasn't really mentioned. And we're starting, like the USDA now has like a live soil as part of their definition for soil health. So I feel like probably in the last 10 years, we're seeing that shift to considering soil as alive. And so when I studied soils in 1998, no one mentioned it was alive like that. And I, I found soils exciting even then before I was like, whoa, you mean they're alive? You know, like this, all of these different organisms doing all these services. And so when I think about, you know, healthy soils and how much we understand about it, it really is this new frontier that we're, we're breaking through and understanding. And um, so much, I think, too, is coming from what's happening in the human health aspect that's feeding into how do soils communicate? How are microbiology communicating? How is it that a plant can signal to a microbe to get a nutrient or produce a, a defense mechanism that it can't do in isolation? And so, um, yeah, this world of healthy soil, I think, is still being like revealed. Like, I, I think we, yeah, we don't have all the answers. Yeah, and as you write in the book, there's a lot of sort of science left to be done, particularly um, when it comes to bacteria and, and other things like that. But um, if you were to meet someone at a, din at a dinner party or some, something like that, and they asked you, what does it mean? What does healthy soil mean? What does living soil mean? How would you break it down into sort of a system that you can explain to them? Mm -hmm. What are the component parts? Well, you got to think that context is everything. Right. And so if I can just use a quick example. So the first time I went to Western Australia, um, I went to see some of the best regenerative farmers probably in the world doing extraordinary stuff. And they're showing me the soil and they were like, wow, what do you think? And I'm looking at it and it's um, red sand. And I was like, um, yeah. So what do you think? <laughs> what do you think this looks like? And, and at the time I had no um, foundation to go now. This is a healthy soil in Western Australia. You know, it has beautiful aggregate structure. It has um, these rhizosheaths on the root system. So we have all of this buffer um, full of microbiology um, that didn't have any herbicide, well, minimal herbicide resistant weeds. Um, and so, yeah, to, to then compare that to New Zealand soil, where we can talk about, you know, healthy soil has that beautiful dark chocolate brown color, looks like a chocolate cake, has all these, you know, crumbs and aggregates, it's full of microbiology and is moist that for a healthy soil definition is very different than where I am here in Idaho right now or Western Australia on sand. Um, but I always ask of people to look back and say, what did this look like potentially before colonization or what did this look like even before indigenous people perhaps arrived in these landscapes? Um, and then what is the potential for this landscape? And is there potentially more that we can do if we start to really listen to and hone into what's the potential for this landscape. So for me, a healthy soil is a soil that is performing, you know, to its full potential in terms of water holding, nutrient holding, and being able to grow healthy, nutritious crops that don't require uh, chemical intervention. Well, let's talk a little bit about uh, the under underground livestock. Um, mm -hmm. what, which is a, a phrase from your book, what exactly is going on under the surface of our farms? In the book, you mm -hmm. call it a bustling metropolis. And, mm -hmm. and we're really only beginning to understand the complexity there, but break it down for us. What's, what's present? Wow. Well, there's an awful lot present. I mean, and there's certainly, um, you know, like they say, you know, more organisms in a teaspoon of soil than there are human beings on the planet um, or stars in the sky. But it's what's interesting to me is the most common organism in soil is viruses, and we know nothing about them. Like we know like so little about them, and yet they're so important in terms of uh, controlling bacterial populations. So, if you didn't have predation on bacteria by the protozoa and the nematodes, so your larger organisms in the soil, then viruses account for 100% of the death of bacteria. So. They call it the forever young phenomenon that viruses actually keep that bacterial population turning over. But how important viruses are for evolution, 
and thinking even about COVID, um, you know, we have, we're so afraid of viruses, but yet they play a huge role in how we became humans or how a plant has evolved to do the things that it does is through horizontal gene transfer and, and the, the role of, of viruses in that. And so it interests me that we know so little about viruses. I mean, we can touch in on diseases, but they are present all through soils. And then the next organism up would be your bacteria. And again, most of the research has happened on how do you kill it? What are the diseases instead of, you know, most of the organisms in soils are incredibly beneficial. And, you know, think of bacteria, they're making antibiotics. They are the glue that holds the fine aggregates and soils together. They are decomposing things. And I think of them as like bags, bags of fertilizer sitting in a shed, right? So they're holding onto the nutrient bodies and they're not necessarily going to let that go until you have a full a predation cycle. So then the other organisms will be your fungi and your fungal hyphae. So, you know, they, they span throughout the soil, they're connecting plants, but they're also decomposing, breaking stuff down. Um, very important in our carbon cycle because their bodies are made of carbon. And also they are changing um, carbon dynamics in terms of respiration from the soil. They, um, what else is cool about fungi is some of them actually form crystals or form rocks. So they are actually drawing carbon down on a more permanent basis. So bacteria and fungi are, you know, your core um, trophic, the base level of that trophic triangle in terms of decomposition. Um, and then you've got your nematodes and your protozoa or your protists. So they are your flagellates, your ciliates and your amoeba. So the first single celled organisms on the planet and they are actively like eating the bacteria and the fungi or they're eating each other and they're forming these corridors and hallways and super highways through the soil. So how water and air and nutrients can move through. Um, and then they are actively cycling those nutrients back to the plant. So that plant is actually there almost driving that whole system in terms of these are the nutrients I need. This is the stress that I'm under and is stimulating all of these different types of microbes to, to respond using different types of chemical signaling. So yeah, those would be like the smaller organisms. And then obviously you can get into your earthworms and mm -hmm. arthropods and, you know, the role of ants and termites and, and the large organisms. But, you know, I think for a lot of growers and that we, um, you know, it's invisible. So, you know, actually getting a microscope to have a look at some of these organisms can really bring it home in terms of, oh, wow, you know, this system is alive. It's not just, you know, fairy dust and magic in terms of this important role in microbiology. And, you know, you're describing what's going on underneath the soil, but then there are things going on above ground that are also, you know, important to sort of pay attention to. For example, talk about the wisdom of weeds. Um, you, you have a whole chapter in your book on how weeds aren't just this problem to be dealt with. They're, they're actually communicating and sending messages yeah. to us about yeah. what the soil needs or in what state it's in. Yeah, and I, I, I love weeds because of that reason. You know, people will be telling me about this terrible situation that they're dealing with. And I'm like, oh, sounds fantastic. You know, <laughs> I right. love the the delving into, you know, why is it that this is a specific issue here and why is it encroaching or why is it expanding? And then some of the tools that we can have in order to address that. But, you know, there's, there's some basic, I guess, drivers behind why you might be seeing weeds. So one is bare ground. You know, anytime we're going to have bare ground, who is it that's going to need to cover that? Because nature does not want to have bare surfaces, right? Because they're going to blow away or wash away. Um, low organic matter is a big driver for certain weed populations. Having a microbial imbalance or having a mineral imbalance um, or even having toxins. Um, so yeah, I had some really interesting case studies where it was actually some kind of toxin in the soil that specific weed species will actually come in and deal with. And the one I think I talked about was milk thistle. And what was interesting to me was seeing all this milk thistle in these areas that were either high in radon or high in um, like antimentics, like chemicals, and and kind of having this aha moment because milk thistle is something that we use for human health as a liver detox. And I'm like, wow, that's right. so interesting. Like that whole reflection between the human health and and cells, and then what's happening in the soil as well. Like sometimes it just it just blows my mind the like microcosm to the macrocosm. Um, but mm -hmm. yeah, 
yeah, there's just so much information to, to do with weeds. And I think the more that we can start to key into it and start to address the root causes, then we're seeing cleaner and cleaner fields. And I'm finding this in Broadacre. I've had guys get a little freaked out because their fields are really clean and it, it, it feels really weird for them. And they're like, I think this is a good year for wild oats. Like there's just no wild oats. And I'm like, well, the neighbor's not having the same experience. And then they have that kind mm-hmm. of uh, moment that actually it's what they've been doing in terms of management that's been addressing these, you know, and if you see things like the herbicide resistance is now just, it's out of control with what's happening in some places now. And there's 300 like plant species that are herbicide resistant, if not more. Um, and some of these weeds, they're hitting with multiple chemicals to try and control them. And it's like, you're going to run out of bigger hammers. Like we can get more 2,4-D and dicamba and we can just keep upping it up. But at the end of the day, those weeds win. Like they keep winning. And we're going to run out of that, those kind of hardcore chemicals. And I think that time's probably coming soon too. Um, and so what we're seeing on these properties is as we start to bring in that vital life of you know healthy soils and having microbiology that change the signaling for what is it the type of plant that germinates we're seeing that those plants actually um, are affected by herbicide at far lower rates and we don't know what the dynamic is there's something that's either happening in the seed microbiome Mm -hmm. of seed seeds or something in terms of the thickness of the outside of that um, seed wall that these these plants are no longer herbicide resistant within one to two years of being in a biological system where we're using microbial um, stimulants that are going down with the plant or using them as foliars that we're seeing that signal switch and so that um, these weeds become easier to, to control. Well, you just used the word signal twice in, 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 yeah. in, in your response there. And, and I'm wanting to know more about that process and what you mean by that. Yeah, so... Um, if you think about how alive soils are and all the different types of organisms, each cell wall has like a hundred thousand receptors for for listening in on different types of chemical signaling or hormonal signaling, um, or different types of proteins. So the cells are actually keyed in to respond to different types of signals. And so those signals might be coming from each other. Um, they had some really cool work that was done where they were watching um, protozoa hunting down a nematode signaling to each other using these chemicals and they were hunting it down like a wolf was chasing an elk um Mm -hmm. but you think all those organisms in soil they don't have eyes they don't have mouths they can't communicate that way so how they're communicating is through these different types of signals so some of them are proteins some of them are hormones some of them are fats and they're they're basically I i guess sometimes the enzymes is they're using those to communicate and the plants doing the same thing so microbes will communicate to say, hey, look, I'm your friend. Sometimes microbes will pretend to be a different type of microbe so they can sneak up and, and, and consume the other one. And, and some of those signals are coming again from plants. So the plants are sending, sending out just hundreds of thousands of different types of these signaling metabolites to um, basically build up that underground workforce around that root system to say, you know, I need these types of metabolites. I need this type of nutrition. Um, so there's some interesting work that happened in um, trichoderma. So trichoderma is a very beneficial fungus. So it's a fungi that eats bad fungi. But what they found was that, and it's one way I think about plants, is like plants outsource a lot of their organs, like their stomach or their, um, their, their whole gut system or their immune system actually happens outside of their body. It happens outside of the roots. And so with this trichoderma, the plant signals, it says, I'm, you know, I've just been attacked by a disease, signals to the trichoderma, the trichoderma actually responds with these metabolites and it stimulates the whole defense system in the plant. So the plant can now produce proteinase or, um, yeah, so proteinase when it's a response to an insect that it couldn't do um, efficiently without the, the trichoderma being there, which is really interesting. So it's, if we compromise that biological system around the root system, then the plant's whole gut isn't functioning like it naturally would. Its whole immune system is compromised because it's signaling, but there's no one there to respond. So yeah, this whole realm of biological signaling, again, is really new. Like we're looking in the last decade that this this research is happening and it's been really happening in the human health world. 
And now mm -hmm. we're seeing it spiraling out into soil. And as we begin to understand those signaling processes, um, what do you foresee the applications to arise from that to be? Well, or the what, benefits, rather? Yeah, well, what I'm seeing is what's happening already is that we are using what really would be something like parts per trillion, because that is the level of signaling that's happening in the soil is parts per trillion. And so we are doing things like using, I mean, I am a big fan of vermiculture. I, I kind of, I have to admit it, I don't think anything does it better than a worm. <laughs> and so we're using things like two pounds an acre or two kilograms a hectare of vermicast as an extract onto rangeland. And we are seeing soils come alive. Like we're seeing um, plant species germinate that haven't been seen in areas, like the one example, hadn't been seen for over 60 years. We're seeing these grasses coming back or these forbs coming back in response to something that's parts per trillion. So I think um, particularly in broadacre applications is, do you need to be putting all the biology out? Do you need to have you know, all these different things or can we have something that's just an extract and, and be using that at very low rates? So you know, in, in effect, what we're putting out is biological insecticides or pesticides or um, nutrition or phosphate solubilizing byproducts or whatever that turns your soil on. So it's not having to put bacteria or whatever um, that you brought in India or mycorrhizae that you got in another country, but how is it that I can turn my soils on? And so I think we're going to see more and more research into that space of what, what do we need? What, what are these different signals? And not trying to, um, which will probably happen commercially, is you just put, you know, I have the one answer, mm -hmm. there, one silver bullet that's going to do it, but instead thinking, what is that uh, metropolis of signals that potentially we could use to to um, re-enliven soil. Well, I'm going to transition just a little bit. Um, in, in the book, you're, you're constantly making the connection between soil health and human health, not just as sort of metaphorical, uh, in, a, in a metaphorical way, but uh, in a very literal way. Um, and the connection between human health and soil health is not coincidentally the theme of the September issue of our magazine. But yeah. I was hoping you could give us sort of a, an overview of how those things connect um, and, and why that wasn't always well understood and maybe is, still isn't well understood. Yeah, I think, I mean, like we're talking about the perfect storm of what's happening in agriculture and cropping. We're also seeing the perfect storm in what's happening with human health. So they're saying 100% of human um, immunological inflammatory disorders come from the gut. So it comes from how well is your gut functioning. And also they found that the gut is actually your primary brain, that the signals, the synapses that fire, fire in the gut before they fire in the brain, which is just fascinating. Um, and so they're discovering, you know, you think about that whole process of, you know, you're going to chew food to make it smaller, break it down. Well, and if we think about the soil, you know, that's your arthropods, that's your, you know, your different insects, the earthworms or whatever are going to break that food down to make it smaller. We swallow it. There's all these acids that start to work away to break that food down. In the soil, we have acids that are produced by your fungi and bacteria that help to break open and release bonds even in rocks, you know, so releasing phosphate, for instance. And then you pass it into that gastrointestinal system, which is, you know, just alive with bacteria. And, you know, that's where most of the hormones is being produced is actually in your gut. That's where antibiotics are being formed, different types of enzymes. And then the, that microbiology is making your food small enough so it can pass into the bloodstream. So the same thing's happening in the soil, that you've got all those bacteria and fungi and breaking it all down, all these acids to make it fine enough and small enough so the plant can now uptake it in plant available forms. So I think seeing um, a lot of the breakthrough research in terms of the gut microbiome and what is happening in this human health breakdown, you know, between allergies and, I mean, the disorders that you see people facing now that were unheard of, you know, 30 years ago, um, and now, I mean, you can't not speak to somebody in the street probably that isn't dealing with some kind of autoimmune or allergy type system. Um, and so I see that very much reflected in terms of what's happening in the soil. And, mm -hmm. you know, if you think about human evolution, we have evolved with these microbes, like there's, there's probably one, 
one of our cells for every 10 microbial cells in our body. So we are more of a bacteria than we are a human being. And where those bacteria came from originally was the soil. And so we've evolved alongside this type of microbiology. And now we have soil systems that um, are basically totally disabled. I mean, we're taking out, I mean, there's still microbes out there, but what we find is a lot of them are bacterial and a lot of them are disease organisms in our highly modified um, industrial agriculture model. And so I, I, just, I just think that there's no separation. You know, I think what we're dealing with in human health absolutely comes back to soil health and the microbial community. And when it comes to nutrition, um, I remember I had a friend in, in college who would ridicule me for going to a farmer's market and paying a lot of money for like organic vegetables. And he, he would say a carrot is a carrot is a carrot. Um, if it looks like a carrot, it doesn't matter if it's organic or conventional or whatever, it has the same nutritional profile. And we, yeah. we now know that that's, that's just not true. Um, and talk a little bit about um, that nutritional sort of linkage between soil and, and human health and food. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, again, thinking about how our, how our gut systems are compromised and then how that affects nutrient uptake. It's the same around that root system. So if we're doing anything to compromise the microbiology, that plant might be signaling for, let's say, zinc, um, and it's not able to, to take zinc up. It's, it doesn't have the microbial community involved in that, so now it's not in our food. And so if you look at World Health Organization um, food composition charts, you can see that loss of nutrition over time. And I, hopefully these guys don't mind sharing if I share this little story, but um, I'm here on Alder Spring Ranch and they are working with Fred Provenza, who's been looking at anti-inflammatory compounds in their beef. Um, and so if you imagine um, a graph that has up in the top right corner is anti-inflammatory compounds from their beef. So they have some of the highest that they've ever measured in terms of these different compounds that these animals are picking up from being in these um, diverse, vibrant landscapes where they have been really focusing on soil health. Now they compared it to the Impossible Burger and the Impossible Burger is down in that bottom left quadrant, might be all right, um, of right. inflammatory mm -hmm. compounds. And so it's like, we are so desperate to try and, and this is the knee jerk reaction Thing again about ecosystem services is we we're so concerned about the environment that we throw the baby out with the bathwater instead of thinking how would this work in nature how how could we have systems that function so we go to an industrial model that has you know zero meat or whatever and we're buying um, you know industrial soy products that are full of inflammatory compounds that in the end are not going to be any better for the environment or any better for human health um, yeah, so there's a, there's a direct relationship in terms of what's happening with microbiology and diversity to the quality of the food that you're producing. So sure, you know, the Green Revolution produced more food, but at lower quality, you know, and we can put nitrogen out onto these fields and we can grow visually more, but it's not more nutrient dense. So one of the things that we look at is relative feed quality when we're dealing with livestock operations and find that just by addressing microbiology, we see a massive lift in relative feed quality. So what that looks like for the cows is they spend less time grazing, they spend more time lying down and more time putting weight on, um, but it means that then effectively we can, we can either run more animals or for some of my guys, they can sell land because they're like, actually, we don't need all this extra land. So the same thing's happening with humans is we are like eating more and more and more because we're missing vital trace elements or enzymes or vitamins in our food. And it's like that quantity didn't make up for that lack of quality. And you also write the book about um, nutrient dense plants, plants in particular with a high bricks number um, are not just better and more flavorful. They also uh, repel or mitigate pest pressure. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. And I think that's fascinating that, um, that that just happens to coincide. Talk a little bit about that. It, it, it is so interesting. And I know for many people that um, using a refractometer or brick, so that's a way that we can measure photosynthetic capacity or how much sugar's in that plant and how, many, and, you know, how much dissolved solids. So it's one indicator in terms of nutrition. Um, and it can be controversial because there's so many factors involved with measuring it but I, I encourage people to get curious about you know how do you take a good measurement because we see this again and again and again with some of the best regenerative producers in the world is that their bricks is getting higher and higher and higher 
and that insect pressure goes down, the disease pressure comes down and that flavor profile comes up. I mean, I've been on places and you, you, you're either like eating their grass or their apricots or their apples and just going, I've never tasted like this. You know, this is not, this is not the food that we see in the supermarket. And for the grass, you go, wow, I, I could actually eat that as a salad. I mean, it's so incredibly tasty. But um, yeah, we did some work on this in New Zealand and I've seen um, other places do this work. And I know there's researchers here in the US that are looking at what, you know, what are the precursors for insects to come in? And it's not a given. Insects are not attracted to everything. And you see it, it, it is interesting to see these fence line patterns where you'll see something like a cricket or a locust will come in and take out everything on one side of the fence and not touch the other side. Mm -hmm. It's the signaling thing again. So insects are attracted to those signals. And so if a plant um, has some kind of disruption in terms of complete um, proteins, or uh, Jerry Brunetti used to talk about the funny proteins right. all the time, you know? So if we have that formation in the leaf, it's actually a signal that signals to the insect to come and clean up garbage, basically. And right. so with complete proteins being formed, if we have the trace elements that we need for defense, so things like manganese and copper, then we don't see the same pressure, the same insect pressures at all. So it's about how do we support a plant in optimal health and it's not going to be ringing the dinner bell for insects. So we're seeing some pretty catastrophic insect attacks happening around the world right now. I know there were big locust swarms in South Africa. Um, there's something happening in Australia called pasture dieback that's hitting tens of thousands of acres in Queensland. And it actually looks like they've been herbicided. And um, when you go and dig holes, what we're seeing is mealybug and seeing some kind of crown rot. And I think hopefully the, uh, the fabulous Dr. Don Huber's all over it. So he's been invited to take a look and um, see what are those drivers? What are those precursors? Because the insect's not the problem. There's something else coming in um, that's signaling to that insect. So if we just focus on the insect, which you find all the time, like if we're dealing with diseases or insects, everyone's just focusing on how do you kill it instead of why is it that we have the conditions for mealybug? And if you look at what's happening in Queensland, I mean, huge drought pressures for a long time, um, you know, that's going to put stress on a plant. But what's been interesting to me, and I, I would really like people to, to get in contact with me if they're seeing it, is I've been seeing it in Montana and Idaho as well. So what it'll look like is if you pull, um, if you pull those plants up, you, you'll see it first as um, gra grass pull. So an animal will, like a cow, she'll wrap her tongue around that plant and pull it. But when she does that, the grass, the roots will actually come out as well. And when we have a look, there's these white speckles and that's the mealybug. And there'll be like this little black, little rot in there as well. So there's a fungus and an insect. Um, and so I think what we're seeing is, uh, we're seeing more climactic pressure changes and you know, I, you, we're going to have to really lift our game in terms of what's happening with management, so that we're not ringing the dinner bell for insects. I tangented. Sorry. <laughs> no, not at all. Um, I, I want to talk about the work that you do. Your company's called Integrity Soils, and mainly, or it's my understanding that you're working with transitioning people to more regenerative processes. And I'm interested in hearing how that plays out. Um, and I'd love to hear you talk about the kinds of farmers that you're working with and maybe some of the commonalities and challenges you're seeing over and over again. Yeah. yeah it's interesting because we really um, started out as an educational business and, and that's probably still where my heart is and where a lot of our focus has been. Um, and so the consulting has almost been something that has kind of pushing away that I've been reluctant to do because it's a big thing, you know, going on to a property to, um, you know, not trying to tell people what to do, but, you know, like giving recommendations and, and having people be, you know, people, people do what people want to do sometimes. And, and you're like, I don't, I don't really think that that's what I recommended. And, and it did it go well or didn't it go well? And having to hold people's hands and all of that is a, is a challenge um, for me. But I do have a, a crew that are just absolutely inspirational to work with that are based in New Zealand and Australia. So we are offering more consultancy services over there. Um, and certainly the plan in the next year is to expand. But some of the biggest challenges I see is that there's not enough really highly trained consultants um, out there. There's people that are very knowledgeable, but they don't necessarily have um, like a coaching background or an education background. And I think it's 
it's a challenge to think, all right, I have this knowledge, but it's not necessarily going to be very helpful to you if you're not able to um, effectively communicate that or coach someone through the process because uh, coaching is not telling people what to do. It's not just coming in and going, hey, I have the answer. It's being able to work with people and really get their world, what they care about, what they're passionate about, what's already working well and what's actually going to work in their particular circumstances because everybody's different. Um, and so my whole team are very highly trained in like neuro linguistics programming um, behavior change, organizational learning, um, adult education, because I feel like if we don't have that foundation, um, then all the information in the world's not gonna not gonna be effective. And so I feel like we're quite effective as a team and quite effective in our coaching work because we come from it, I think it's a different angle than, hey, I've got the answer. Because we don't either. Like it's yeah. <laughs> you know, regenerative agriculture is very much about what's the exploration what are your whys what are the drivers for you know what is success for you yeah so you're as much a life coach as you are an agronomist or whatever totally and i think Mm -hmm. we're more life coach than we are the agronomist because it helps people right people are the the biggest aspect of what we're dealing with um yeah, I mean, some days I feel like I don't terribly like people all that much, you know, like I'd be quite happy just living in the mountains by myself. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, being able to to kind of, yeah, empathize and understand where where people are coming from. And I think that's what's, that's what's enabled me to work maybe with some of these, um, the Hutterite or Hutterite colonies is, um, yeah, I'm pretty well trained in not judging people, like being able to just be in people's worlds wherever they're coming from and and what you find what I find is we we are working with really progressive innovative people and maybe I live in a very isolated bubble where it's yeah it's pretty fabulous the people that I get to work with Um, but being very curious about you know what I find is most people really do care about the same things which is they really care about their families they want to leave a legacy they don't want to leave their kids a whole lot of debt um, they don't want to be so stressed. Um, you know, there's some very commonalities wherever we go and, and it's like, okay, in your situation, how would we actually relieve some of this stress? And, um, you know, and I found some of this work, what we're dealing with is it's a transition of consciousness. It's not a, hey, I'm going to do a different practice. I'm not going to till or I'm not going to use this chemical. It's how do I see the world? Because Um, I really like that quote, you know, if you change how you see the world, the things that you see change. And it's so true. And when I, when I was interviewing people in the book to see that their lives are like pre-regenerative agriculture and post-regenerative agriculture, they talk about a reduction in stress. They talk about if you stop seeing the world as something to kill and control, and you start to see it as something that's giving you clues and wonderment, the stress that lifts, um, it's just phenomenal. And, and you know, how do we frame success? You know, that, that for me was just fascinating to discover people are like, you know, what I really enjoy now is I'm seeing all these partridges and I'm seeing foxes and there's all this life coming onto the property and then how that makes their hearts sing as opposed to before I wanted it all to be, you know, low grass and it was all uniform and it was just one grass and, you know, like, and you moved by a calendar or you sprayed by a calendar to actually we've brought back the art and creativity into agriculture again. And I think that just inspires people. Whereas, you know, some of the conventional guys that I work with, they've lost their spark, you know, I'm going to do this on this date and then I spray this and then I spray that and I'm in my tractor all the time. And I made a dollar an acre, you know, (laughs) like who wants that? And who wants their kids to do that? So Is is that why they're contacting you and reaching out is because they've lost their spark and, they're wanting to do something else. I mean, who, who are the yep. people who are reaching out to you and, and what are they wanting? Uh, it's, it does seem to change. It is changing through time we're finding. Um, yeah. And it's probably different from New Zealand to Australia to here. Um, but I think people that know that there's another level and even if they have, maybe they've been doing holistic management for 30 years and they know that there's another step or for conventional guys, they've had some kind of aha moment and it might be, it might be, look, they just, they just can't continue to do this or it might be, 
a health concern. You know, unfortunately, I think we see quite a lot of that. Um, is that people become so sick that they can't be around the chemicals anymore, but they still love agriculture. And it's like, well, what, what other options are there? Um, yeah, these days I'd say probably my client base in the US is changing to sort of more large scale grazing operations, but it might be that that's something that I really enjoy being on. As I, I mean, I love being around cows and um, mm -hmm. being out yeah out here on the range um whereas new zealand you know increasingly we're dealing dealing with dairy farmers um and we've got more horticulture clients coming in um yeah so it's really hard to put people into a box right. um i think in new zealand we're seeing drivers around legislation um around nutrient management and then there's a very exciting initiative that's just been released and I don't know if it's public, but I'm going to share it anyway, which is that um, <laughs> New Zealand Merino has just announced um, a regenerative certification. I don't know if they've announced it anyway. They well, have, it's it's uh, announced now. It's announced now. Uh, right. You heard it here first. And so right. when they put out that um, notice to New Zealand Merino producers, over 50% of New Zealand farmers, um, high country, you know, Merino producers signed up. And so that's a game changer, folks. You know, if we're seeing half of New Zealand uh, merino producers sign up to, to, to regenerate landscapes, to regenerate their businesses, um, that's, a, that's a change maker. So I'm very excited to see we, are, we have more support mechanisms. So in New Zealand and Australia, there are now banks that want to see your soil tests and want to see your soil carbon. You know, are you imp improving soil carbon? Um, those kind of structural supports are helping to really influence change. Um, and I look at some of my producers um, in Montana and the uptake of regenerative agriculture in, in ranching up there has is, is just been phenomenal. We reckon in one area, there's probably over 50% of that land under ownership is, is now running regenerative programs because they, they really want to see these landscapes thrive. So I think in different areas, there's different structures in terms of what is driving that change and who is it that's coming to, you know, to come and talk to us. But it's certainly a very diverse crowd. And, you know, as far as I'm concerned, this is the future of agriculture and, and it's, it's moving fast. Well, that sort of anticipates my next question, which is what are some of the success stories that you've had that stand out? Mm. Um. So many. I mean, and I think if you're thinking about the behavior change, um, you know, some of those success stories are, are just the, seeing the success of what people get in terms of their lifestyle change and fulfillment. Um, but yeah, there's a case study that I talk about in the book, and um, um, it, it was it was pretty neat to work with. So it was a it was a great um, a ra a racing stud, so a, like a bloodstock. Um, horse racing stud in New Zealand and we we built a millimeter of soil every month on that property so what was kind of neat is at the time I had an unlimited budget so we could um, address their limiting factors which in their case was you know really tight soils um, they had um, basically taken you know deep gullies whatever we call them coolies or gulches different language I don't know but anyway gullies and mm -hmm with soil and then taken that off the top of the hills so they're taking the top of the hill and put it into these gullies and so in some places they only had like an inch of soil so we could measure it really well as we were doing our soil program you know and it, you know scientists will say to you oh it can take 500 years to build an inch of soil and here we were building a millimeter a month like it, it was phenomenal to see and addressing some pretty big issues they had in terms of um sodic soils so they had been irrigating with brine um, and I noted at the start of the session, you talked about the sponsors being humic and fulvic products. So we were using humic and fulvics to help address the sodic conditions um, and just create soils that started to hold on to water better so they weren't having to irrigate as much. We saw a big change in terms of insect pressures. Um, we basically saw a drop of insect pressures by 95% um, through a couple of different mechanisms that we did. But ideally, you know, at the end of the day, we were lifting the health of those plants. But what was also really interesting is that they reported a difference in how those animals were behaving. So those horses had been quite spooky, um, had been, you know, just a little dangerous on the track, and then all those behavioural problems changed. So the bloodstock agent was saying it was the best that the, the livestock, the horses had ever looked coming off that property. Um, 
And it was really unfortunate because I was working with the farm managers, not the farm owner, that the farm owner just wasn't, he wasn't connected to what we were doing at all. And so we ended up not working together, which was really disappointing because we were doing some cool stuff and I would like to have seen it progress, but he wasn't like, soil health was not his priority. It was very much a bloodstock operation, but um, yeah, it, it's incredible what, what we can do. Um, you know, especially in good climate. So, you know, working here in the US has been interesting in, in terms of working in some of these semi-arid environments in terms of how long does it take to shift some of these, um, you know, soil health aspects or the animal health aspects and seeing that, you know, things move faster than what I thought was possible, particularly if you're looking at bringing more diversity in because it's like plant diversity starts this upward virtuous cycle instead of the downward spiral. So if you start to have you know, living green roots in, in that soil system um, and diversity in there, then these systems start to take care of themselves. And, and that's what we've been seeing here in the Midwest that has got me really, really inspired for, yeah, what's possible. And, and being here at Alder Spring Ranch and just seeing, um, so they're using a, they call it in herding. So effectively a type of range riding where we are living with cows 24 seven um, and moving them strategically to see how these, these landscapes are just coming alive. And it's like, I think many people felt like this is it, you know, this is, this is as good as it's gonna get in some of this semi-arid land, semi land. And you think most of the world's agricultural land is in this state, you know, it's desertifying, it's very low production, um, very low water holding capacities, and yet we can change these soils. You, you write in the book, and, and um, I think you're quoting Gary Zimmer, that you have to earn the right to go chemical yeah. free or input free and it's um and it's not just about cutting certain inputs out of the operation is it um talk a little bit about cold turkey transitions and why they're destined to fail mm, yeah um yeah and i think it's something that probably gave the organic movement a, a bad name when it kind of first came in which was you know just pull the rug out and we're going to go into you know not having any chemicals no nitrogen or whatever but you've got a system that's um, you know, you think your gut system's being compromised and, you, you know, you're taking all sorts of pharmaceuticals to support your health and then you just pull the pharmaceutical drugs out, but your gut system's still compromised, you know, you're going to, you're going to have health problems. And so we see this in a lot of systems is that they're addicted to water, they're addicted to nitrogen, um, they're addicted to the, to the chemicals. And so what we call it is the methadone program. Well, I don't say that in public. I just said that in public, didn't I? Um, <laughs> is that how do we wean that system off so you don't get this big detox crash? Because um, those root systems, when you go into many properties where they have been using a lot of chemicals or chemical fertilizers, is the roots are only this deep. And suddenly you take that fertilizer away or you take that irrigation away and that, that root system's not developed. That plant hasn't learned to start to work. So I really like Gary Zimmer's earn your right because I don't think we just go and pull systems out and, and think that, oh, your plant's going to be fine, even though you know all your nitrogen fixing organisms are not there. If you've been applying nitrogen fertilizers, your azadobacter, your frankia, all those free living nitrogen fixes, which should be very common, are not common at all because they're not required if you've been putting nitrogen and, and then you expect that system to work. And what we find too is that if you have been using a lot of nitrogen fertilizers, it feeds a lot of bacteria. And I said they make the small aggregates. So what they do is it collapses your soil system. So we have um, very fine particles in those soils that are prone to surface crusting. They don't breathe well. They don't allow water movement. There's no biology making that metropolis. You know, there's no hallways and, you know, there's none of that structure in there. So your nitrogen cycle won't work because the nitrogen cycle requires gas diffusion and aggregate structure. It requires microbiology. Um, and so nitrogen can be one of those ones that people really struggle to, to pull out of the system. And yet I find we can typically drop nitrogen by 30% in our first year with no changes in production. And on some of these operations I'm looking at, I'm going, nitrogen's not your problem. And we're probably mm -hmm. dropping nitrogen by 90% with no change in production. So it's very much, it's not necessarily pulling the rug out, but it's looking for what is it that's putting a drag on my production and addressing that first. And so for most people, it's compaction. So address your compaction, and then you find that that system might actually start functioning and you can get off that chemical treadmill fast. 
Um, but yeah, there's some things I will pull immediately. The neonicotinoids, I'm sorry, they gotta go and they should probably be banned. Like I, I'm, I'm black, very few things I'm black and white on, but that one needs to go. And so we will get that out of a program in year one by using different types of biological seed dressings instead. Um, but yeah, so there's some substitutions that potentially you can do um, rather than just, I'm just gonna go cold turkey and do nothing because uh, you are, yeah. There's some people that have done it, um, but yeah, I'm not willing to risk it. Well, so how do you measure regeneration? What is regenerative agriculture and how, how does it, how is it quantified? I mean, I've heard someone say that a asphalt basketball court that has a weed growing out of a crack in the middle of it is tending toward regeneration because it has life that's coming up. Uh, I thought that was funny, but I also maybe not that helpful in the context of agriculture. Um, I'm kind of curious to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, and, and it's interesting because for me, being regenerative is not just about the soil. Um, you know, it does include profitability. It does include the social aspects, the, the wellness aspect, um, as well as soil and animal health. But for me, it is that progression of, are you requiring less inputs to prop a system up? And is that, is the outcomes improving? So in your asphalt, is the water quality better this year than it was last year? All right, and, and you know, I guess we can say by how much, but for me, it is outcome driven. You know, are we producing better quality food? Um, you know, have we got better water holding capacities? Are your rooting systems going deeper? Um, so there's a lot of things that we measure and we've actually developed an app with the Soil Mentor Group in the UK to really look at how do we trend that over time? Um, and then also how do we compare that to others, which I think is gonna be really fun. So we, we've developed it in a way that you can actually compare yourself to say, the whole of the Midwest or um, all of New Zealand is how am I performing and hopefully that gets people competitive juices going in terms of how good can you get it so you know for some people they might be they might feel like well you know I've got a few more weeds this year I've got you know more living green root maybe for them that's success but um, it, it that's where I think it is difficult to quantify because it is you know how good are, are you improving your systems year on and year on and, and can you continue to farm in this way for 500 to 1,000 years? You know, and I've got operations that I work with that is their mantra. You know, are we using inputs that would be sustainable in the next 1,000 years? And, and if they're not, then we need to pull them out of the system and look at, you know, how do, we, how do we really know that we are actually really stewarding and, and nurturing this land? Well, so, I mean, in partly I asked that, because I think there's some tension um, that I've observed between sort of the organic certification people and um, folks who are using the regenerative term a lot, um, and particularly in the context of sort of corporate food production, where you have big companies like General Mills and others who are, you know, embracing quote unquote um, regenerative agriculture, and I think that makes some some people uneasy because there's not necessarily a system in place to put a stamp on something and say that's regenerative. It's, it seems somewhat subjective, but at the same time, I'm wondering if it's a more effective tool to use in transitioning farmers off of sort of the industrial chemical treadmill that they're on. Yeah. Yeah. And I think so many organizations are asking this very question right now and, and the risk of greenwashing is already happening. I mean, people are leaping all over the term and if you see articles coming out of New Zealand media right now is they're like oh we're already regenerative because as far as they're concerned they do rotational grazing they have green crops you know they're green living plants all year round uh, minimal disturbance oh you know we're, we're regenerative and that's where I think the outcome side of things and really I'm excited more about ecosystem services markets you know really looking at have you got more pollinator species out there? You know, what is the quality of the water that's, you know, is your water cleaner than the water that came onto your property? Um, you know, I think we really need to be looking at those outcomes. And I think we're gonna see certification that's outcome based very, very soon. Um, but yeah, those definitions are really loose because we are in this like emergent birthing phase. And I think if we get too tight on, you can't do this or, that kind of dogma, then we shut down that innovation. And, and I just, I feel like 
some of the certification involves a lot of dogma and it's like well why couldn't you use that just because it's um you know been chemically manufactured but we know that actually it's really beneficial um why put a why put a restriction around that you should be able to whatever way it takes you to regenerate your soil as long as we're seeing all these other ecosystem services improve then you should get it ticked to the box so um yeah i think it seems like there's a lot of people working in this space that something's going to come out of it to stop the greenwashing and stop the big companies coming in and going, oh, well, we are. Because, you know, I think consumer confidence is at an all-time low in terms of trusting what companies are doing. You know, that whole pasture rate, greenwashing stuff, it makes me so mad. Um, and, you know, I meet people all the time that tell me about how their food is nutrient, more nutrient dense. And I'm like, cool, can I see your testing? And no one's got it. They're just out there saying it. And it's just these empty words, basically. And I'm like, if you're going to say that you're regenerative, show up, show up and, sh and show how, what that looks like. And um, one thing that's been quite upsetting to me is seeing a lot of operations that really are building soil man they're building some beautiful soil and, and i've seen some guys in new zealand doing some extraordinary stuff but at the cost of livestock like seeing animals really suffering really skinny looking like you know the humane society should be rolling up but meanwhile they're getting all this attention because of what they're doing in soil so we can't just restrict our regenerative thinking to one small aspect you know uh, are you thrashing your body and you're you know you're working 24 7 to get this to work that's not regenerative you know you're not looking at your own well-being in this process and there's a lot of people out there doing that right now you know and they look so ill it's like that's not a good that's not a good look if we're really trying to regenerate systems it starts with us yeah well what are some examples of successful systems that really stand out in your mind that are just exemplary um I have folks that are, you know, would be some of my favorite people to work with that I do, I do think are doing an extraordinary job. Um, I, I, I love what Gabe Brown's doing, you know, to go out to his place. I mean, he gets, he's certainly getting a lot of attention, but well-deserved. I mean, you know, in terms of what he's doing with the quality of what he's producing and, and soil outcomes and the brilliance of having that early measurement and you know, I think not enough producers measured early enough to show you know look at how remarkable this is I mean here at Alder Spring their their fields down here went from two percent carbon to six and a half percent carbon um, on their you know the irrigated ground which is just fantastic um, the Hatterite colony that I talk about in the book um, Twin Rivers, who, you know, they're on a witness protection scheme. They hate me talking about them publicly, I'm sure. And uh, they'd give me permission to put them in the book. And now I think they're regretting it. They had to change their numbers. Um, <laughs> is like, we are building probably half a percent carbon a year. And and to see like their, their willingness to learn, their, um, they're really passing on that regenerative mindset to the younger generation who are learning how to use microscopes. They're learning how to like, they're producing like their own compost, their vermiculture, they're making extracts, they're making trichoderma, they're making their own nitrogen um, biologicals. Like to work with people like that just makes my heart sing to think, you know, here's a whole generation of young people coming through that have all those knowledge and skill and talents. Um, you know, the future's looking really bright. And so, yeah, that they're always an operation that stand out just for their ability to think and to question and the willingness to, like when I started working with them, they pulled their entire program on 23,000 acres and put it fully into a biological program. And I'm like, that that's extraordinary. And I asked them why they were willing to do that. Cause I was kind of like, do you, do you want to just trial something? You know, should we just, you know, let's just do a thousand acres. And they were like, no, if you've got two feet in the fire, you don't take one foot out. And I'm like, <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Let's do that. Um, yeah, so I right. just, those are people that stand out for me. And also Indralin Ranch and, and Big Timber. I absolutely adore working with them because of this curiosity, this transparency, the, the willingness to really look at things that aren't working. You know, I find, you know, for some ranches or farmers, when you work with them and they're like, no, that, that's too hard. I don't want to look at that. I had a, um, a melon producer I was working with in New Zealand and they had a lot of powdery mildew and we were using a compost uh, tea 
and the tea wasn't working. And no matter what we did, we couldn't figure out what was wrong with the tea. And we would look at the tea and it was dead. And we tried different extracts and trying this and that. And finally, I said to the guy, look, I think, I think your water might be the problem. And he's like, oh, it's not my water. That's the water supply that we drink in the house and it's fine. So I stopped working with him. And then two months later, I see in the local paper that the local landfill had been leaking into their bore water and into the groundwater. And these guys had been drinking water that was coming out of landfill. Um, and that's why that was causing the powdery mildew as well. So for me, that's who stands out is the people that are willing to ask the questions that are willing to ask those hard questions, even if, if you're not sure what your limiting factor is and it might be you, um, that willingness to go, it's me. And, and for so many operations, actually, it's me. You know, you've got to, you've got to be willing to look in the mirror and look hard um, because, sure, we've got a lot of legacy load in terms of poor management in the past and why your soil's in this condition. But from here on now, everything comes back to you. It's not, um, it's not an external force. It's not the government. It's not your supply company. It's, it's you. And, and those are the people that, um, yeah, are just so fun to work with. You talk about limiting factors, and in particular, there's one book, uh, chapter in the book about water and climate change that's particularly um, fascinating. But I want to hear your your view on the challenges that are laying ahead, the limiting factors that are on the horizon, mm -hmm. and how we overcome them. Mm. I did a workshop maybe three years ago in Western Australia, and the Western Australian Minister for Agriculture, Alana McTiernan, actually came to that workshop, which was such an honor. And what she said at the beginning of her talk was, if Western Australia is not practicing regenerative agriculture, there will be no agriculture in Western Australia in the next five to 10 years, which I just thought was absolutely shocking and probably incredibly realistic. And, um, you know, working with some of these Western Australian producers and seeing uh, I think maybe four years ago, there was a big frost incident in, in WA and they lost, like some areas lost 80% of their crop to frost. The regenerative guys across five different blocks only lost 5% to frost. So one of those processes, you know, is lifting your bricks, but it's also having microbiology out there that actually, so there's a microbe that will specifically eat the frost forming microbiology. So I talk about that in the book, but we need to be thinking resilience. We need to be thinking, do I have hugely deep root systems that have those rhizosheaths that can defend themselves against fluctuations in temperature? Do I have a soil that operates like a sponge? So if I have, you know, 10 inches of rainfall, can I absorb that? Or does it just flow off? Am I sitting underwater for the next six months? You know, we have systems now that have no resilience. They have no backup to changes in climate. And so for conventional industrial model right now, Climate change is terrifying, absolutely terrifying. Now, do I think it's going to be easy for anybody? No, I don't. But I do believe that we can build more resilience into this system. I do believe that we can have systems that can deal with fluctuations in temperature or water or you know drought or floods or whatever it takes. But we need to be focusing on it now because I do believe we're running out of time. What What, what does a resilient food production system look like to you? Does it look like... Is it biologically diverse? Do you have, you know, crops alongside animals, alongside mm -hmm. wildlife, alongside open space? What I mean, what is it? Yeah. What does that picture look like to you? Yeah, diversity, diversity, diversity. You know, and and not being afraid to kind of step outside of what you thought. You know, I should only be doing cows and calves, or um, you know, this is great vegetable production land. But instead, thinking, okay, what are other food sources? You know, like the big. We, there was a pretty big grasshopper plague last year here in the US or all the way up through Canada as well. And all I was thinking was why doesn't someone make a, a grasshopper like harvester, grind it up and sell it as protein to people in California. Now, if someone does make it, can you give me a share of that company? I'd be really interested. Um, no, but like, it's, um, how do you turn those negatives into a positive? How do you look at what your resources are? You know, people are wanting, you know, meat-free protein well harvest those grasshoppers um you know people are getting more interested in different types of fungi why not be growing fungi um you know there's some amazing cordyceps mushrooms that exist in many of these landscapes around the world why not have that as a side business we were looking at a worm farm recently and calculating 
like a return per hour of work and the worm farm was earning him $500 an hour compared to you know some of the things he was doing on the ranch which are probably costing him money and so looking at what are some of the other diverse enterprises that you could have on your farm or your ranch and you know people go oh I've got a slug problem I'm like that sounds like a duck deficiency to me you know like why haven't you got ducks <laughs> you know yeah. I think often we're just we're just thinking too small and it's like okay how how can we have other things that don't necessarily add a whole lot more work but are very complementary um and i think diversity is is key i actually had a dairy farmer that i was working with and she wanted to borrow some money from the bank to set up a chicken operation and they they wouldn't give her the money so she just went and did it herself and there was a pretty big um drop crash in the dairy market in new zealand and that year she got through because of the chickens. I mean, she was selling enough eggs that made more money than what the, the dairy operation was bringing in while it's benefiting your land. So I think we just need to be thinking more diverse and everything is like, how do I get more diversity? What kind of diversity? You know, selling diverse seed blends, you know, selling seeds, whatever it takes, but looking to, I guess, projecting a little bit into the future in terms of what are people looking for? Well, we're seeing, you know, this interest in alternative grains or things like, mm -hmm. which I just think is fabulous, um, of like, you know, how do you be ab above the curve, I guess, and not just, I'm going to do corn and soybean because, yeah, there ain't much right. money. But so, looking more at, okay, what, what are some of those key crops that we see coming through? Right. So my takeaways were, we're not thinking big enough in diversity, diversity, diversity. diversity is that diversity. it? Yeah, 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 I think so. Well, Nicole, I'm just thrilled to have you here and thanks so much for your time. And we really appreciate you. My pleasure, Ben. This has been awesome. Thanks so much. And thank you for listening to another episode of Tractor Time brought to you by Acres USA and Live Earth Products. Subscribe to our channel on YouTube, iTunes, or anywhere podcasts are available. Also find us on acresusa.com ecofarmingdaily.com and don't forget to subscribe to our monthly magazine. Thanks for listening and have a great week.